Hello, I'm Dr. Ken Landa. Thanks for watching. Let's talk about Zocor. Zocor, or simvastatin, was approved by the FDA in 1991. It's a statin drug. Statins lower cholesterol. It's in the same family as atorvastatin, or Lipitor, or Crestor, or Pravacol. These drugs are major sellers in the United States. Actually, each one of those drugs ranks among the top 25 prescriptions written by doctors every year. It's estimated that more than a third of the adult population takes cholesterol-reducing medicines or is a candidate to take cholesterol-reducing medicine. Interesting thing is that maybe the cholesterol problem is because you have some other kind of disease. So you have to be screened to make sure that your cholesterol elevation isn't because you have hypothyroidism or diabetes or liver disease or you're taking steroid for some other kind of reason. And it was found in the mid-1950s that there was a chemical inside the body and it was known as mevalonic acid. It was found to be mevalonic acid. And then they discovered that that mevalonic acid was necessary in order to manufacture cholesterol. And the liver is what manufactures cholesterol. It's not the cholesterol you eat that floats around in your system. It's the cholesterol that your liver manufactures that we test and, and we say, oh, you have high cholesterol. So a couple years later, they discovered the enzyme that was responsible for manufacturing the mevalonic acid. So then they searched and searched and they found a chemical that would block the production of the enzyme that was necessary to get to mevalonic acid. And when they found that, they found that they could dramatically reduce the cholesterol inside the body by changing the way the liver made the cholesterol. Remember, the cholesterol in your system is made by your body. And if we block the liver's ability to make the cholesterol, then your cholesterol level will go down. And we can use these drugs, these statin drugs, all of which work by the same mechanism. And we can divide them into several different categories. We can say we have the high potency drugs, that's Crestor and Atorvastatin or Lipitor. Those can reduce your cholesterol by more than 50%, your bad cholesterol by more than 50%. On the other hand, your moderate potency statins, they reduce your cholesterol from 20% to 40%. So that would be simvastatin or Zocor or Pravacol or Pravastat. They would fit into the moderate potency family. Now, the high potency drugs at lower dose, they would be moderate in potency. The simvastatin that you get in the bottle from the pharmacy, the Zocor, that actually is not an active drug. It has to be metabolized in your system to another chemical known as symphostatic acid. And it's symphostatic acid that is the active drug. If you take a 10 milligram dose of Zocor, your cholesterol is going to fall between 20 and 30 percent. If you take a 20 milligram dose, your cholesterol is going to fall between 30 and 40 percent. If you take a 40 milligram dose, it's going to fall around 40 percent. Well, if you want more than a 40% reduction, then you have to switch over and you take a Torvastatin or you take the Crestor. Well, it used to be, in old days, that we used an 80 milligram dose of Zocor, but it was found that the 80 milligram dose of Zocor, or Simvastatin, could cause harm, cause cause harm to the muscles, increased incidence of myopathy or muscle problem, and it also caused problems, especially in Chinese individuals, they don't seem to metabolize it the same way as non-Chinese individuals. The level builds up, and they're more likely to have toxic reactions to it. Same sort of situation in people who are taking niacin or niacin-containing drugs. So we start those individuals on low dose, maybe only 10 or 20 milligrams. And if a person has renal disease, maybe only 5 milligrams. Now, according to the package insert, you should take the Zocor, the simvastatin at night, because the cholesterol is manufactured by the liver when there's not a lot of dietary food product floating around in the bloodstream. You're not in the process of digesting things. Well, that might be important. On the other hand, 
with the high potency statins, it's definitely not an issue. And certainly not an issue even with the simvastatin if we're targeting mostly the triglycerides or the HDL. Now you can take the simvastatin, the Zocor, with or without food, doesn't seem to make any difference. The medicine works better in people who've already had some sort of cardiovascular event. We call that secondary prevention. So if you've had a heart attack, if you've had a stroke, if you have angina, if you've had an angioplasty, the medicine probably will work considerably better than if you're otherwise healthy and maybe you're old or maybe you're a smoker, or maybe you have high blood pressure. So the more the risk, the better the pill works. It works better in men than it does in women. And it seems to work better in people who have higher levels of the LDL or the bad cholesterol than people who have just little elevation. You would have to treat somewhere around 250 people who are at risk only because of risk factors, not because they have a history of heart disease, but they just have some risk factors. Maybe they're heavy, maybe they're smokers. You have to treat them 250 people for about five years to prevent one death. So a lot of people, these drugs, are not really dramatic in otherwise healthy individuals. If you're pregnant, you probably shouldn't take the simvastatin. If you're breastfeeding, you probably shouldn't take it. If you have active liver disease, not for you. If you have kidney disease, you have to take a lower dose. Has some side effects, but the side effects tend not to be too severe. So nausea, constipation, diarrhea, cause some indigestion, cause some gas up above or down below. Some people get headache or dizziness or abdominal pain when they take the drug. And some people complain of joint problems. And sometimes there's some liver damage, a type of a hepatitis, rarely, not a viral hepatitis, but a chemical hepatitis. Some people lose their appetite with the drug. There's an issue with muscle injury or muscle damage or muscle soreness or weakness. It all depends on how we define the problem but there's some kind of a muscle issue that occurs in between 1 in 10 and 1 in 20 individuals taking the drug. Maybe it's going to be some soreness or weakness or tenderness of the muscles. Partially, it's due to warnings. So the doctor says, hey, you may have some muscle injury. The person goes home, he said, I have muscle injury. I'm a little sore. I have muscle injury. Well, that happens a lot. And as a matter of fact, if the people aren't warned that they're going to have some muscle injury, they tend not to complain of muscle injury. So we don't know how much is suggestive. But it's definite that some people do develop muscle injury. Enough people so that in 2010, the FDA came out, and even though the pill had been on the market for about 20 years, the FDA said, hey, you know something? There is, uh, there's meaning to this muscle injury stuff. And people who were taking up to 40 milligrams a day would develop some significant muscle injury in about 8, 000, 8 people in every 10,000 people receiving the drug. Well, if the people were taking an 80 milligram dose, the likelihood of muscle damage was 610 in 10,000. And that was especially people who were older, over age 65, or people who had some kind of renal disease, decreased renal function. Just getting older is enough to give you decreased renal function or if the people were Chinese, or if they were hypothyroid. And it seems that there's a specific kind of a variant on the DNA. We call it a single nucleotide polymorphism. We just abbreviate it, SNP. You've heard that probably in the news a lot, the SNPs. They're, they're very common. Well, if you have an SNP in a certain site on uh, DNA, then if you have just one abnormality on one of the two strands of DNA, you could have a 5% chance of developing significant muscle injury, and it would be increased to about 20% if you happen to have two of the abnormalities. And why do you have the problem? Well, the problem seems to have something to do with the simvastatin specifically and the way it's metabolized and the way it's moved around inside the body in those people who have the problem. Now, if a person does have significant muscle injury, there are all different kinds of muscle injury. Sometimes it's the weakness or the soreness, but everything else is okay. But sometimes the muscle could actually get broken down. The actual cells can die, and if they do, then the urine can turn dark or turn red. We can monitor with a blood test and we can see that there are some enzymatic changes. 
the muscles actually break down, and some of the breakdown is going to clog up the kidneys, and you could get kidney failure, and that could progress on to death. So the question is, why wasn't this found in the studies that the drug companies did? If it's such a big issue. Well, the reason is because the drug companies screen the people out. And anybody who has any risk factor at all is excluded from the studies. The people who are otherwise healthy, they tend to be otherwise healthy when they're studied, as opposed to the general population where doctors give the pills to people of all sorts and all health. Well, in 2012, they found another problem. They actually found two problems. So the FDA now more than 20 years after the drug came on the market, said, you know something? It also increases your blood sugar, just a little bit, but it increases the blood sugar in some people, and it increases the glycosylated hemoglobin, or the hemoglobin A1C. So do be careful, because you could make people diabetic, or you could make diabetics worse. Well, fortunately, that's not a real big issue, but it's something that they didn't know about when they started. And then they also said, especially with simvastatin, because it's pretty lipid soluble, so it can get into the brain. They said, you know, it might cause some um, non-serious but reversible cognitive side effects. It might cause some confusion or fuzzy or unfocused thinking, the memory loss. Well, we don't like them to find these things after a drug's been on the market for a long time. That's kind of disconcerting. But fortunately, a study in Nature, which is a major journal, major scientific journal, in April of 2018 found that it really doesn't increase the incidence of Alzheimer's disease, so that's kind of good news. But if we go back to the animal studies prior to the time the drug was used in humans, it was found that the drug caused some liver cancer, liver adenomas, tumors of the liver, tumors in the lung, tumors on the thyroid gland, degeneration of the optic nerve, caused central nervous system lesions around the blood vessels with hemorrhage and edema and deposition of scar tissue around the small blood vessels and some of the small blood vessels died. So a little bit worrisome and especially when they keep coming up with new side effects of the drug anyway. They found that if you take simvastatin or Zocor and drink a glass of grapefruit juice it's going to increase the concentration of the Zocor by about threefold in the system, so don't have grapefruit juice. Okay. Well, you have to also be cautious if you're taking a calcium blocker, if you're taking a drug like amlodipine or verapamil or diltiazem. If you're taking other drugs, for instance, amiodarone or colchicine, you've got to be a little bit careful. There's some interactions. And if you're taking warfarin, it might make you bleed more readily if you happen to combine it with the Zocor. And Zocor is probably not a good drug to be taking with fluconazole or ketoconazole. Those are antifungus, anti-yeast medicines, or clarithromycin, antibiotic, erythromycin even, or certain antidepressants or triglyceride-lowering medications. And we know if you're at risk for kidney problem, then you ought to stop the drug before the kidney problem develops. So, for instance, if you're going to have major surgery, Major surgery, you could have an issue with your kidney, so stop the drug. If you have a severe metabolic or endocrine disorder, condition that's associated with low blood pressure, hypotension, you probably ought not to be taking the drug. We know once you take the drug, it's going to get into the system pretty quickly. Within about four hours, it'll reach the peak concentration. It's going to be metabolized in the first pass as it goes through the liver. The drug's going to be metabolized and excreted about 60% in the bowels and about 10, 15% in the urine. We know that as you get older, the concentration or the amount in the bloodstream is going to increase. Question is, how often should we monitor people who are taking the drug to see if it's working? Well, the package insert says you should check four weeks after you start and then periodically. But Throughout the recent times, the concept has been, no, just take the drug. Take either the moderate potency or the high potency drug, depending on how high your LDL is at the beginning, and then don't worry about it. Don't need any baseline, don't need any kind of special monitoring, just take the drug. But now that's changing. The American Heart Association in November 2018 came up with the idea 
oh, we should be very cautious and we should really scrupulously evaluate people and make sure that we keep the LDL or the bad cholesterol to very low limits. If you've had a history of heart disease, they want it less than 70. If you're otherwise healthy, the maximum is 130. And if uh, you have risk factors, less than 100 on the LDL. Now, other societies would say, eh, that's a little bit too aggressive. And just like you have Republicans and you have the Democrats, you have the people who argue and the people who don't argue, with the story of cholesterol, there are people who are very aggressive about monitoring the cholesterol and treating the cholesterol. And there are other people who say, you know, the evidence really doesn't show that the cholesterol reduction by taking these pills really benefits people who have not yet had any kind of cardiovascular disease. So there is no consensus on where the LDL should be. If you talk about the American Heart Association, they want it very low. Talk about the American Association of Clinical Endocrinologists, they want it very low. Talk about organizations where they're not getting any money from drug companies, for instance, the United States Preventive Services Task Force, they say, you know, the evidence for all of this is really fuzzy. We don't have any really good data to suggest that we have to reduce the cholesterol nearly as much as people say. If you want to see what your risk of having a heart attack is, well, what you could do is you could go to the computer, you could type in cardiac risk calculator, you can find that on the federal government site at the NIH or the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute. You could find it just by typing into Google. You go to the American Heart Association. All you need is your age, your blood pressure, whether you're a smoker or not, what your weight is. You should know what your cholesterol is, whether you have diabetes or not. And you can plug that in and that tell you what your 10-year risk of having a heart attack is. Now, it's an overestimate. The real risk is considerably lower than it says on the calculator, but it gives you some kind of a sense. Most people would say that if your risk is less than 10%, you're probably okay. You don't need to do anything. If you're in the American Heart Association, they say, my goodness, if your risk is more than 7.5%, and maybe even if it's more than 5%, you ought to be doing something. There are other people who say, you know, we don't have any evidence that we're really going to make a difference even if your risk is up to 20% over a period of 10 years. Have all of these different opinions. And according to the American Heart Association, maybe the statins by themselves aren't enough. Maybe you have to take the statin and if you can't reduce your cholesterol if you're at risk to less than 70, or if you're not at especially great risk, less than 100, then you ought to consider adding Zetia, and then if you still can't reach the goals that they set, you ought to be taking the Repatha or drugs like that. Well, the whole story is crazy at the present time. The American Heart Association says that not only do they want to consider your level of LDL and your risk factors, but you also should consider evaluating some of the extra factors that they've just recently devised. They say that there are those enhanced risk factors. And enhanced risk factors are factors that the American Heart Association kind of made up, but they're not factors that are generally accepted by the overall population of physicians. So the question is, do you need maybe something extra. Do you need your high sensitivity C-reactive protein? Do you need your LP small a to be evaluated? Do you need your APO B to be evaluated? Well, what about family history of premature heart disease? What about if you've had preeclampsia? All of these factors that they're throwing into the mix. And you know what you really need to do? You have to consider this. You have to consider that 50% of the population in the United States is going to die because of heart disease or because of stroke, cardiovascular disease. And if you take a pill, that's fine. But the reason you're going to die is because of environmental factors, because of your diet and your lifestyle. If you're a cigarette smoker, taking a pill isn't going to save you. If you're fat, if you're obese, if you're overweight, you 
better go and lose some weight. That's a risk factor. That's a major risk factor. And there's a major risk factor that's going to overwhelm any benefit you get from taking a cholesterol-reducing statin. You better go out and exercise. You better watch your diet. You better watch the amount of calories that you consume. You better watch the amount of salt in your food and sugar in your food. Better read the label of what you're eating because that can be more toxic than any possible benefit that you can get from taking a pill. If you drink too much alcohol, you are going to be at risk. Alcohol happens to be cardiotoxic. So think about some of these things. The only good thing we can say offhand about Zocor is since it's come off patent, it's a cheap drug. You can get it for 10, 20 bucks a month. If you want to take the Zocor, the brand name, it's still available, but it'll cost you $250 a month. And add to all of that, add to all of this pushing of the cholesterol drugs by the insurance companies, by the HMOs. We have a recent study at the beginning of December 2018 from the University of Zurich in Switzerland. They say, we're taking too many cholesterol-reducing drugs. They're not doing what people say they're doing. We get back to the basics. Diet and exercise. Anyway, thanks for watching. I'm Dr. Ken Landau.